Look up at the night sky and let your eyes wander across the vast expanse filled with tiny, twinkling lights. Stars are some of the most incredible objects in our universe. They shine with gleams that are hard to comprehend, sending their light across billions upon billions of miles. They are beautiful and can be explosive, projecting their material through space with a power that makes nuclear bombs seem utterly insignificant. But have you ever wondered about the incredible journeys these stars go through? They start as swirling clouds of gas and dust, and then they go through all sorts of changes until they eventually die in spectacular ways. How do stars even come to be? What's their life story? Today, let's dive into the cosmic dance of stars' life cycles. We'll explore where they come from, how they change over time, and what happens to them in the end. Are you ready for a journey through the stars? Unlock the universe's secrets and organize your cosmic discoveries with Notion, perfect for tracking the life cycle of stars. Notion helps you compile research, plan projects, and collaborate in one sleek platform. Whether you're mapping a star's journey from nebula to supernova or coordinating with fellow astronomers, Notion is your galactic companion. Sign up using our link to start your stellar organization journey and support our channel. Now let's continue our voyage through the fascinating stages of a star's life. Stars are a fascinating part of the sky. Even just talking about them feels magical, almost like poetry. They're made up of most of the stuff in the universe, including the same stuff we're made of. You know, humans are made of atoms that were cooked up in old stars that aren't around anymore. It's pretty wild to think about. Stars do this cool thing where they take lighter stuff and smooch it together to make heavier stuff in a process called fusion. And all of this happens even though they're basically just super hot, dense balls of gas. Stars are like a balancing act. Gravity pulling everything in and radiation pushing stuff out. It's the energy from fusion that causes this push. When things get out of balance, it means a star is about to change in some way. While stars come in all sizes, the basic way they're born doesn't really change. The story of how stars are born begins within the womb of nebulae, vast interstellar clouds made up of gas and dust that permeate galaxies. These ethereal bright regions are more than just beautiful sights. They are the nurseries where stars are conceived and born. Ironically, to talk about how they're born, we need to start by looking at the end. Yep, it's a story told in reverse. You see, when stars die, they scatter their material throughout the nearby cosmos, leaving behind molecular clouds. Smaller stars do this by simply shedding material, while larger stars do so in violent explosions. When enough stars have reached the end of their lives, an area can become filled with these leftover materials. This area is the nebula. Like a mythical phoenix, new stars are born from the ashes of the old ones. These nebulas sure look beautiful, but they're not as flashy as they seem. Actually, if you were inside one, space would look exactly the same as it does to us. Nebulas don't really hold much more material than the rest of space. It's just that the extra material they do have gets spread out over big distances. So from far away, they look really packed. So there might not be a lot of particles, but there's enough for gravity to slowly pull them together. As these clusters become denser and hotter under their own gravitational pull, they start spinning and flattening out into rotating disks known as accretion disks. Through accretion, the material in the disk condenses and collapses towards the center, increasing the mass and temperature of the forming star. When tiny particles come together enough, they make bigger things. And if those things get really big, you've got yourself a protostar, a hot, dense gas core 
that's on its way to becoming a full-blown star. These are basically baby stars still in the making, hanging out in this stellar nursery and not quite burning through fusion yet. But as the protostar keeps pulling in material from the disk around it, its core gets hotter and denser. So, when the core of a protostar hits millions of degrees and crazy densities, something special happens. Nuclear fusion fires up. In this blazing furnace, hydrogen atoms smash together to make helium, blasting out tons of energy in the process. This energy shoots out, marking the start of a new star's life on the main sequence, the stable part of a star's life. Remember that balance we talked about earlier? Well, when a star settles into the main sequence, it finds a sweet spot between the push from nuclear fusion and the pull of gravity. This balance keeps the star shining steadily for billions of years, and its brightness and color depend on how big it is. A star hangs out on the main sequence for most of its life. Take the Sun, for instance. It's a main sequence star and will stay that way for at least another five billion years. But like all stars, even this constant source of light and warmth has a limited lifespan and will eventually use up its fuel, moving on to the next stage of its stellar journey. But while that's happening, we still have some time to figure out what exactly stars do during their main sequence phase. Since we know they spend about 90% of their lives there, it makes you wonder, what's keeping them so busy? The simple answer is, they're just busy turning hydrogen into helium through fusion. But that's the easy way out. If we want a bit more detail, we need to look at the star's mass. The truth is, a star's lifespan on the main sequence is intrinsically tied to its mass. The bigger the star, the faster it burns through its hydrogen fuel and the shorter its life will be. Stars like our Sun last around 10 billion years. Smaller ones, about a tenth the size of the Sun, can last over 100 times longer, like a trillion years. They're practically immortal, but Bigger stars, like ones 100 times the size of the Sun, can burn out in less than a million years. So, while some stars are as old as the universe itself and haven't even hit 2% of their lifespan, others we see in the sky today weren't even born when the dinosaurs were roaming around. Take Orion, for example, the prettiest constellation up there. It's a bummer the dinosaurs didn't get to see it. But let's circle back to what's happening inside the star and why it matters so much. The fusion of hydrogen into helium is the nuclear reaction that keeps the star going for almost its entire life, no pun intended, and it pushes back against gravity. The helium produced, being heavier, gradually builds up in the center of the star because of gravity. Meanwhile, the fusion process keeps chugging along in a layer around the core, known as the shell, where there's less helium. Since helium is heavier, as its amount increases, so does the pressure and temperature. As the star nears the end of its life, that last 10% or so, the helium core has grown enough that the fusion of hydrogen in the surrounding area becomes very unstable. The temperature keeps rising, causing hydrogen to fuse even faster, and the star begins to swell. As it expands, it cools down, and its color starts to change too. And then comes the dark end. We could say this is the most dramatic part of the star's life cycle. But first, let's categorize them into two groups. Firstly, we have the low to medium mass stars, and secondly, we have the cosmic titans, the high mass stars. In the first group, let's take our dear Sun as an example again. As stars like these approach the end of their lives on the main sequence, they undergo quite a dramatic transformation. With the hydrogen in their core depleted, helium fusion begins, causing the star to expand and cool down, becoming a red giant. Here's what happens. When the core temperature exceeds 100 million degrees, the helium in the core starts fusing to form carbon. The energy produced from this new reaction, 
coupled with the increased hydrogen fusion in the shell, results in a pressure buildup that surpasses gravitational pressure, causing the star to expand once again, this time more violently. The surface area of the star grows so rapidly that even the increased energy production isn't enough to heat the entire star, which progressively cools down. The star then starts to shine with a reddish hue, hence the name Red Giant. However, its total brightness is much greater than its original brightness on the main sequence. A red giant can be 10 to 50 times the size of the sun. Arcturus, Aldebaran and our sun in the future are examples of red giants. When we see red giants, we're looking at stars that are in the twilight of their lives. Turns out, for stars with masses less than eight times that of the sun, like our sun, carbon is the heaviest material they can create. They just don't have enough mass for gravity to squash the carbon core, enough to make it hot and dense enough for carbon fusion to happen. While this is going on, the outer layers of the star puff up really big, possibly swallowing up any nearby planets in orbit. As these outer layers drift away into space, they create a fancy-looking cloud of gas and dust called a planetary nebula, a shiny layer that surrounds the star's core. And once the hydrogen and helium are all used up, the star collapses down onto its carbon core, forming a white dwarf, a huge diamond the size of planet Earth. They're super bright, which is why they're called white dwarfs. But they're not shining from fusion anymore. All their light comes from the leftover heat. Picture this. The surface of a star is hot in the thousands of degrees, but a white dwarf surface is hot in the millions. But eventually, those white dwarfs cool down and fade away slowly over billions of years, becoming black dwarfs, the death of what once was a source of light. Surely becoming a black dwarf is the fate that awaits our sun when it reaches the end of its days, and Earth is nothing but a memory in anyone's mind. Wow, that got deep. But don't be sad. That's just the circle of life reminding us of the inevitable impermanence of us all. But let's put aside thoughts about life and death for a moment and keep talking about stars, because we still have one more group to analyze. What happens to stars that are a bit bigger than the first ones? Well, to start with, these are stars that have between 11 and 50 times the mass of our sun. So we're talking about true giants, and as you'd expect, they follow a more dramatic and violent path to their demise. As they use up the hydrogen in their core, they swell up into red supergiants, colossal swollen stars with diameters rivaling the size of our entire solar system. However, this swollen state is short-lived as the star's core continues to fuse heavier and heavier elements, culminating in an explosive end, a supernova. In this cataclysmic event, the star's core collapses under its immense gravity, creating the most powerful explosion in the universe, well, second only to the Big Bang. A supernova shines with a brightness greater than that of all the stars in a galaxy combined. But only for a few weeks. During this explosion, the temperature increases almost without limit, creating the conditions necessary to synthesize elements even heavier than iron. All these elements are expelled in the form of nebulas and will become the building blocks for new stars and planets, starting the whole life, death, and rebirth cycle again. Each new cycle uses more hydrogen and helium from the original fusion and makes even more of the heavy stuff. That's why stars from different generations have slightly different compositions, just a tad. So, what's left of these stars is the core of neutron matter, spinning thousands of times per second. These bodies are called neutron stars, or pulses. A neutron star has a mass similar to that of a small star, squeezed into a tiny body just a few kilometers across. Its density is incredibly high, about 1 E 
15 times denser than water. This means that a coin made of this material would weigh more than a mountain. But the consequences of a supernova can be equally mind-blowing and lead to some of the most extreme objects in the universe. You see, the nuclear forces that stop the gravitational collapse in a neutron star are incredibly strong. However, they're not limitless. If the original mass of the star is around 20 times that of our Sun, like Rigel, Deneb, Antares, and Betelgeuse, the process of compacting doesn't stop at neutron matter. Nuclear forces can't hold back gravity anymore, and there's no other force to stop the collapse. The result? The birth of the weirdest thing predicted by physics, a black hole. A black hole is a massive object that occupies no physical space. Its size tends to zero and its density to infinity. Its gravity is so strong that it creates a small spherical region of space where nothing, not even light, can escape. A perfect prison. And I get it. All this talk about massive stars can make our sun seem a bit boring. But the stars that shine the brightest are often the shortest lived. Those giant stars burn fast and furious, and our sun will outlast many of them. So sometimes it's not just about how brightly you shine, but how long you can keep it up. And yes, I'm talking about stars, but I guess it can apply to any other field too. While the life and death of stars may seem like a cosmic tragedy, it's an essential process that contributes to the rich tapestry of the universe. In fact, stars are like factories that produce all the heavier elements in the universe. As stars shed their outer layers or explode as supernovas, they enrich the interstellar medium with heavy elements forged in their blazing cores. These elements, including carbon, oxygen, iron, magnesium, silicon and sulfur, are the building blocks of planets, complex molecules, and even life itself. Without the cosmic alchemy performed by generations of stars, the universe would be a sterile, lifeless expanse, devoid of the rich diversity we observe today. And even after stars die, their leftovers, like white dwarfs, neutron stars, and black holes, play a vital role in kick-starting the birth of new stars. They act like magnets, pulling in nearby gas and dust and sparking the cycle of star formation all over again. Who would have thought that, as we look up at the night sky, we are actually witnessing a cosmic dance of stars being born, living their lives, and eventually dying right before our eyes? It's fascinating and quite poetic, and it's definitely a part of life itself, considering a star's death is inevitable. This cycle in the universe is a powerful reminder of our connection to it all the atoms that make up our bodies, the air we breathe, and even the ground beneath our feet were all created in the hearts of stars that burned out long ago. We are literally made of stardust. The offspring of these celestial travelers that have journeyed through space and time. It's hard to find anything more poetic than that. So next time you look up at the night sky, take a moment to appreciate the amazing sight unfolding before your eyes. Each shining star has its own story, marking the incredible journey it's been on, shaping the universe we call home. Did you know about this life and death cycle of stars? Share your thoughts in the comments. Thanks for joining me on this journey through the stars' life cycles. I hope it sparked your interest in the wonders of the universe. If so, subscribe for more adventures exploring the mysteries of space. See you soon.